Hello and welcome back to Between the Hashes, everyone, our weekly college football primer coming to you from Los Angeles, California. I'm your host, Matt Keim, here to break down the most exciting and important bowl games this season. The thing to know is that college football has the weirdest postseason by a country mile, and there's there's a long storied history as to why it is, and I might actually do a video on the history of bowl games later in the offseason, but that's neither here nor there. Where we are now is that there's approximately 30-something, I think 34, bowl, 35 bowl games currently being played. I'm only going to talk about the New Year's Six games, those being the Cotton Bowl, Sugar Bowl, Orange Bowl, Fiesta Bowl, Peach Bowl, and Rose Bowl. With Rose and Sugar obviously being the playoff matchups this year, each of those will get their own video later on this week. Believe me, I haven't forgotten about those games. So today I'm just going to focus on the four best of the rest New Year's Six Bowls, so Cotton, Peach, Fiesta, and Orange. Part of the reason why talking about bowl games is so weird and why the college football season is so bizarre, uh, for a lot of these teams, they haven't played a game, like Ohio State for example, they're going to be playing Missouri at the end of this month, uh, I'm shooting this video on the 22nd of December by the way, they're going to be playing uh, Missouri about a week from now on the 29th I think, the 29th or the 30th, one of those to and they haven't played since their game against Michigan last month so it will have been nearly over a month since they last played. I don't know too many major sports at any level where there's such a long gap between games and you're gonna and you see some weird stuff happen as a result. So one of the things that happens is that following the season guys start declaring for the draft and if you do that and hire an agent what it means is that you normally lose your eligibility and so a lot of guys who declare for the draft will do it with the intention of opting out of the bowl game. That's a relatively newish trend as in within the last 10-ish years or so for guys to do that and the sheer numbers that they currently are and we're seeing plenty of opt-outs along the way another thing you see is the transfer portal is completely wide open and so on the first day it was open following i think it was following the championship games or following the uh, like that monday following the championship games the transfer portal opened and at every single level of college football over 1300 players enter the transfer portal and so we're seeing just and then and then you have coaches leaving getting fired taking jobs elsewhere and so a lot of times the teams that you see are teams missing coaches missing half their starting roster or just teams that are in kind of complete chaos teams that are disappointed to be there and don't really care about that game all that much or just want a nice vacation or teams that are really excited to be there because it's their first or second time ever in school history getting to a bowl game. It's a very, very, very wide array of factors going into this postseason, and uh, we're going to see a few of them on display with these games. But one of the reasons why I'm highlighting just the absolute chaos that uh, college football kind of is this time of year, a lot of people use bowl season as kind of a referendum on the season before it. So, like, let's say if... Um, Let's say if Ohio State loses to uh, Missouri, let's say if all the SEC teams, for example, win, win the New Year's Six game, so that would be Ole Miss, Georgia, and Missouri. You know, you know, people are retroactively going to say, well, that means the SEC is unequivocally better than this team or that team, or that team was overrated, or this team was underrated. Well, there are elements of truth to that, one of the best measures of that kind of thing is actually draft picks, and so the SEC leads by a fairly healthy margin in that department. Part of the reason why that's not, like, what I'm saying is that you can't really use bowl season as anything other than just a series of one-off exhibition games with a million different factors going into each team's performance. So that's, uh, that's kind of my little lead into talking about the Orange Bowl. So the Orange Bowl, Georgia and Florida State, is a, is a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. The line on that game, the line on that game is 14 and a half, favoring, uh, leaning towards Georgia. So with Georgia, let's let's look at the Georgia side for a minute, but because I have a lot to say about Florida State, Georgia's starter at quarterback Carson Beck has actually announced that he fully intends to return next year. So we're going to be seeing him under center again one more time. They just signed in the number one recruiting class. They're doing fine. There is some um, ambiguity around 
the health of certain key Georgia players like Ladd McConkey or Brock Bowers. Bowers especially has been kind of mum on whether or not he's even going to play in the game. It kind of seems like he is, like he's, he's just been very, very quiet. So we don't really know what we're going to see in terms of Georgia's NFL draft ready guys. But they were kind of a young team this year, and so they're going to have a lot of consistency from what they were in the regular season. And what they were in the regular season was one game away from making the playoffs. Both of these teams were, actually. You can make the argument that had Georgia beaten Alabama in the SEC title game, both of these teams get in, and neither of the one-loss teams do. One game drastically affected the fate of both of these teams. And the funny thing is that had Georgia won that game and had Florida State gotten into the playoff, this probably would have been the first round matchup too, funny enough. And so in a lot of ways, this game is kind of a what could have been bowl, but don't use this as a referendum on whether or not Georgia should have made it, and especially don't use it on whether or not the committee was justified in leaving Florida State out, which they were not. The reason why I say that is that half of Florida State's starting roster has already opted out. Jared Verse He's opting out of the game. Keon Coleman's opting out. Obviously, Jordan Travis won't won't be playing. So we're going to see an extremely different Florida State team than what we even saw just a couple weeks ago in the ACC title game. You know, there's kind of like a joking thought that if Florida State were somehow to win this game, they should do what UCF did a couple years ago and claim a title. I will say that one of the major selectors... Uh, that awards these things actually did give UCF the title that year, so they would have, in theory, at least a lot more legitimate claim than Florida State would. But, you know, if they're 14-0 and coming off of a win over Georgia, who's to say they won't? The outrage from Florida State over being left out of the playoff has continued. The Florida State government, Ron DeSantis, has gotten in on this. The Florida Attorney General has set aside a million dollars to explore litigation against both the ACC and the CFP committee. Florida State Board of Trustees actually, as of this morning, has launched a lawsuit to get out of the ACC's grant of rights. And so this is getting messy. And honestly, this this move from the CFP uh, may honestly have just destroyed the ACC because we're going to see a massive ripple effect if this goes through. And so that's going to be a story to watch as we go through the offseason. That and probably the Michigan scandal are the two biggest stories in the offseason. More on that as I get more information, but it, it is a wild development. But the thing that I keep coming back to is that if Alabama and Florida State's positions were reversed, so let's say Jalen Milrow got hurt a couple weeks before the end of the season, but they still beat Georgia in that game, and Florida State, you know, lost to LSU but steamrolled everybody else, or, or what have you, Alabama would still have gotten the benefit of the doubt, and Florida State still wouldn't have gotten in. And that's really the big issue. It's, it's just anti-competitive. And it's antithetical to every core value of organized team sports. But, 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 I've already got my piece on that out of the way. So with this game, I have a hard time seeing Georgia lose this game. Just with, with the continuity Georgia's going to have and how Florida State's players are already kind of starting to drift off everywhere. The administration's kind of a mess and very, very pissed off. You, you could make the argument that they're going to be mad enough to unify for one more game. But they've already been told that these games don't matter, so why should they care? And so what I'm say what I'm trying to get at is that because Georgia has a lot more continuity both on and off the field currently, it's it's a little hard to see them A losing or B not even covering. So I'm gonna give Georgia the win and the cover here. But like I said, regardless of the result, it should not be used as an ex post facto justification for this decision. Uh moving on. Ole Miss and Penn State, two teams that were kind of neck and neck in the rankings pretty much for the last two months of the season. Uh, they're kind of like that. These two teams kind of mirror each other in a couple ways in that they're kind of like the best of the like the next best tier where they're beating everybody else, but they're losing to the top teams in the conference. Obviously, they got here through very, very different ways. Ole Miss was led by experienced quarterback Jackson Dart, who played really, really well when he was healthy. Ole Miss had a good running attack, but they were hurt. But um, they, were, they had some injury issues up there throughout the early parts of the season. And you can argue that that kind may have cost them pretty drastically against Alabama. Meanwhile, Penn State was a very young team. A lot of their key guys on both offense and defense were underclassmen, so either redshirt freshmen or sophomores or what have you. And I've been saying this throughout the year about Penn State. 
they may actually benefit from the conferences, go, the Big Ten Conference going away from the, the divisional format more than anybody else, because that means they don't have to play Ohio State and Michigan in the same year every single year. As disappointing as it is to see the Ohio State-Penn State game go away as a yearly staple, because it's always a great game, I think it actually benefits Penn State a lot. And Penn State's pattern in these games is that even though they're losing to the Ohio States and Michigans of the world, is that they typically do turn around and win these games, because there is still a pretty good talent advantage and we see that they're only giving up like 200 yards a little over 220 yards on defense a game all meanwhile Ole Miss is giving up nearly 400 yards of offense per game I I think from that standpoint there's not too many opt-outs with this particular game I don't think so for the Peach Bowl I'm gonna give Penn State the win in the cover it's only a four point spread because of how they looked against Ohio State and Michigan Penn State's uh, value has been kind of undersold a little bit the biggest factor for me is that I and I've been pounding this drum all year Ole Miss is terrible on the line of scrimmage and Penn State is actually very very good especially on defense so I think Penn State will be able to control the game because they can control the line of scrimmage so Penn State wins the Verbo Fiesta Bowl with Oregon and Liberty with Liberty as the official G5 representative so a quick reminder on that whomever is the highest ranked G5 team automatically gets sent to a spot in the New Year's Six games. This year, it's Liberty out of Conference USA versus Oregon. No disrespect to Liberty, but, but that's kind of a rough draw for Oregon after having only been basically one or two plays away from getting into the playoff themselves. Remember, they lost by three in the Pac-12 championship game and that and two days before the final rankings were shown and so that pretty much knocked them out of the running Bo Nix and Bucky Irving despite declaring despite the fact that both players are going to be going to the draft have both announced their intention to play one more time with the Ducks and so we're gonna get to see that offense and this team pretty much as a complete unit play one more time I just have a hard time seeing Liberty keep up and again a lot of my game picks do come down to who I think is better in the lines of scrimmage, usually. Unless one team has such an overwhelming advantage on the perimeter or something like or 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 on the back end of the defense or something like that. And so I think Oregon, their their MO has been like with the exception of playing against Washington, their MO has been kind of to just grind teams into paste and come out fast, hard, and then just kind of break a team's will in the first half and then just control the game after the first quarter. It's what they did against Colorado. It's what they did against Utah. And it's what I think they're going to do against Liberty here. So it's, it's a 17 point spread. So this may be the highest spread I've picked all year. Oregon wins. They cover. Good season, Liberty, but you know, it's just not enough to compete with what Oregon has. And that brings us to our final game today, the Cotton Bowl, featuring a top 10 matchup, Missouri versus Ohio State. So there's um, there's a lot of noise around Ohio State right now. They had a number of guys transfer, so there's kind of like a panic in the fan base about this whole thing. I will say that outside of two of those players, most of those guys were backups or people who probably weren't going to be too competitive in terms of trying to get a starting position next year. And like, just I'm going to speak less as a, um, a pundit and more as a fan for a moment. I have no issue with guys trying to go somewhere else to you know, do what's best for their career. They have every right to do that. If coaches can leave at the drop of a hat two weeks after taking a job or like a week after getting a, recruiting a kid into signing at a school and then leaving, if coaches can do that with impunity, I think the players should be able to as well. We're not seeing too, too many opt-outs out of this particular game just yet, but there is one very notable exception. The big headline around Ohio State is that quarterback Kyle McCord transferred out shortly after the Michigan game, and he has now landed at Syracuse. So we'll be seeing him play for the Orange next year, which means that Devin Brown, the other quarterback who he was competing for in the first two or three games of the year, uh, to see which one could claim the starting position. Devin Brown will actually get the start against Missouri. And this will be our first time really seeing Devin Brown outside of very, very limited action or, you know, a drive here or there or as like a gadget player, like very specific, like goal liney or short yardage type situations. And so this game is really just going to come down to whether or not you think Devin Brown is up to the task. There's, I, there's really compelling arguments to who could win this game either way because Missouri... Uh, like I, I just said, Old. 
Ole Miss was the best of the rest. Missouri is actually the best of the rest. They're the ones that played. They probably should not have lost to LSU. You know, every pick, I, I almost every game I inv involving Missouri that I pick, I get wrong. So I'm going to get this one wrong as well. But um, they played Georgia the closest outside of Alabama, obviously. And they had to do that in Athens. This is a very solid team with a very good running attack, and quarterback Brady Cook has had a decent season, 20 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, and so we're going to see a lot of continuity from that team on that front. Why they could win is that they just have more continuity and momentum as a team. Maybe psychologically they're more excited to be there because Missouri has been in a horrible spot as a program basically since Gary Pinkle left like a, a, a while ago, so they've been kind of in the wilderness. Coach Eli Drinkowitz has this team on the on the rise and so there's a lot of momentum to this program and it's a very good accomplishment for them to be here meanwhile ohio state there's just so much noise with the fans with the transferring with the recruiting with with um the third straight loss to michigan that you can see why their heads might not be in it nearly to the degree that you should be when you're playing against a top 10 team if missouri wins it will be because they can run the ball and control the line of scrimmage kind of like what michigan could do although i don't think they're nearly as talented up front or with you know blake Corum's a better running back but they if they they could in theory at least follow the michigan playbook and win the game for ohio state to win the game um it's really simple there's not a lot of noise on who has and hasn't opted out yet um a number of their key defensive players who are definitely going to the draft next year so like tyleek williams denzel burke have announced their intention to play in the bowl game. Uh, the big question marks with Ohio State are Marvin Harrison Jr. and Trevion Henderson, both of whom haven't even announced if they're going into the draft, although it's, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. is projected to be pr maybe a top five pick, if not a top three. So it's a little hard to see him coming back, but there's rumors that Ohio State is throwing massive NIL deals at both guys to try and get him to come back one more time. We actually just got an announcement from Mecca Ibuka that he's coming back. And so we, it's, who's to say? Um, but more more uh, pressingly, neither of those guys has announced their status for the bowl games. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to play. Remember with the Rose Bowl a couple years ago, and this was kind of Jackson Smith and Jigba's coming out party with the Rose Bowl, CJ Stroud against Utah. Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave were kind of ambiguous as to whether or not they were going to play going into that game. And then with, I think, less than a week to go, it was announced that they were both holding out. And so I'm just going to make this one simple. If Marvin Harrison Jr. plays this game, Ohio State wins. If he doesn't, they don't. And so as of right now, I think the line is like minus one for Ohio State. It was hanging around minus 0.5. This is a true, about as true of a pick -em game as it gets. Ohio State does, has more talent on the, on the lines of scrimmage. They're really good defensively and have been all year. And so I can see a situation where, you know, Devin Brown just makes just enough plays to win and their defense kind of just takes it from there. And so I'm going to tentatively give Ohio State the win here. But if Marvin, like, depending on the status of some of their key players, I may update this pick as more information comes out. So tentatively, Ohio State wins, but I, I really do think this one could go either way. And it's probably going to be the best and most interesting game out of all of these. It's the only game I think isn't going to be like a two-score game. I just have a hard time seeing the other three games be all that close. And so that does it for our New Year's Six previews. Come back in a few days and I will be talking about each of the playoff games. Each one will get their own videos. And remember to like, comment, subscribe, follow us for the John Kime Report on Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. It's Empire with an A. And as always, thanks for sticking around and enjoy the games.